Today's scripture readings come from Acts chapter 7. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, He died. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Who threw that first stone? That's all I really want to know. Was it just a mob-initiated act of violence that day, or, or did someone start with just one stone directed at the young preacher? Not long before, when Jesus appeared in the temple courts, there was a woman who was about to be stoned to death. When the religious leaders kept questioning him, sounds familiar to the reading today, right? Jesus said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. And that settled it. That day, at least. But this scene is different. Stephen spoke blasphemous words against the law and the temple, everything that it meant to be Jewish. He questioned their very identity. We've already read that the religious leaders um, put Peter and John behind bars, and now we find Stephen, another follower of Jesus, who's seized and questioned by those in power. And so those in authority go from being annoyed by his teaching to greatly disturbed to, as we read this morning, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. Can you imagine that sort of anger? It's that sort of anger where you lose control of yourself, where you can't control your emotions, the ability to be rational, and they just lose it as Stephen. And in the midst of this anger, Stephen has this mystical experience. As the heavens open up, he speaks about what he sees, and the religious authorities can't stand it. They covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their lungs, they all rushed at Stephen. They dragged him out of the the city and began to stone him. Stone by stone, his body is crushed. It's a story of relentless mob violence, anger and evil. And I don't know how you felt this morning as we responded, this is the word of God, or hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, thanks be to God. I might have added a question mark at the end of that. Thanks be to God, really? Because what do we do with a reading like this where we face such uh, opposition and, and evil and violence to the point of death? Because I don't know about you, but I've never faced such a thing in my own life. For most of us, we haven't been in positions where we have felt excluded or even persecuted because of our faith. But it does make me consider this morning, what am I willing to give my life for? What am I willing to give my life for? I'm not referring exclusively to these sorts of acts of violence being put in the same position that Stephen was in long ago, but in the sense of sacrificing my life every single day for my faith. Longtime professor at Princeton Seminary, Donald McLeod, always opened his class in the same way. He asked his seminary students to open the class in prayer. 
And so one day, a seminarian from China, who likely experienced some form of persecution because of his faith in his own life, volunteered to open his class in prayer and shocked everyone by what he said. Oh God, give us something to die for. For if we do not have something to die for, we have nothing to live for. Amen. And that was it. When the class sat there in silence, stunned at the power of this prayer. The story in Acts reminds Christians that we are, are baptized into the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ which means that we die to our old selves, our old way of life, and we are raised with Christ into something, in fact, the only thing that is worth living for, the life of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And it's in that reality that we're able to live and die and sacrifice in the name of faith. And Stephen must have known this reality in his life, right? That in his life, he lived this way of Jesus. So much so that he was able to preach clearly and directly to the religious establishment and not get distracted by the violence and the anger and the evil that he would face in his life. And he was able to keep his gaze upon God alone. And so what does Luke tell us about this man named Stephen? about his heart posture, about his spirit. Well, going back in Acts for just a moment, we read that Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. When opposition arose, they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave Stephen as he spoke. And when they saw Stephen's face, it was like the face of an angel. So after Stephen offered his wise sermon, recounting the, the history of Israel and the glory of God found throughout, the religious leaders were, were furious at what this man had preached, and they were ready to kill him. And so did Stephen draw his sword to fight back? No. Did Stephen run the other way? No. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This preacher, St. Stephen, the first martyr, was remarkable. He had deep faith. And we're invited to do the same, to sacrifice uh, places in our lives where we get hung up on, on focusing on the wrong thing and instead placing our gaze, our look, our hope in Christ alone. Because when Stephen's described by Luke, he uses words like grace and power and wisdom and shares Stephen's act of forgiveness, recognizing that it all comes from the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. When Stephen faced the worst of what humanity could throw at him, just like his Messiah before him, he stood strong in his faith, he placed his trust in Christ, and he followed the Holy Spirit that was with him, recognizing that it was only out of the power of the Holy Spirit that he was able to do what he did. When Stephen looks up to heaven, Luke tells us that he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Did you catch that? Now, most of the time in scripture, we find Jesus doing what? Sitting, right? At the right hand of the Father of God. But here we find the only place where Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. And Jesus is standing as Stephen's advocate and help, not removing him from the suffering and persecution, but giving him the strength to offer forgiveness and life in the midst of, of a gruesome scene of death. Several early church theologians have written about the significance of Christ's standing. Saint Ambrose in the fourth century observed that Jesus stood as Stephen's helpmate, 
He stood as if anxious to help Stephen, his athlete, in the struggle. He stood as though ready to crown him martyred. Then let Jesus stand for you, Ambrose wrote, that you may not fear him sitting, for he judges when he sits. In another place, Ambrose wrote, Jesus sits as judge of the quick and the dead, and he stands as the people's advocate. Jesus stands as the people's advocate. Just as Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come to be our advocate, would come to be our help in times of trouble, who would come and help us stand firm in the faith, Jesus is our advocate. And when we connect our lives so deeply with Christ, we're able to do remarkable things that's beyond our own power and ability. And it might not be the giving of our lives in the same way that Stephen did, but it might be in daily acts of sacrifice and forgiveness in the name of our faith. As they're stoning Stephen, Stephen whispers a prayer in the theme of a Jewish child's bedtime prayer. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And just as Jesus prayed for forgiveness for those who tortured and and would eventually kill him, Stephen, still, still filled with the Holy Spirit, does the same and prays, Lord, do not hold this sin against them just as Jesus did before him. In a beautifully poetic moment in other translations, Luke tells us he fell asleep. Throughout this entire scene, Stephen keeps his gaze on what? His eyes focused on what? Now, he could have focused his eyes, set his gaze on anger, right? Or revenge, or the mob that chased him down. But Luke tells us he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. His gaze was toward heaven beyond the earthly realm into the kingdom of God. One of those daily sacrifices for us might be to reflect on our gaze, our focus, what we are looking at day in and day out. Because I don't know about you, but for for me, it can be easy to watch the news and hear only bad news. It can be easy to focus only on that which is difficult and challenging in life. But, But God is calling us to focus on Jesus and follow him into doing remarkable things and being remarkable people. Jesus is calling us to focus on the good news. Several weeks ago, I received a call here at the church. And as I told you at the beginning of worship this morning, uh, uh, on the other end of this phone call was a woman by the name of Alicia, who simply says she wanted to, to talk with me as she saw many of us from our church praying down the street where her son was killed back in December. And she started talking and sharing about her son and, and she was like, I, I don't know, really know what I'm asking you for, Pastor. I just wanna talk. And I believe through conversation and the power of the Holy Spirit, we, we kind of came together and she shared that on June 11th, it would be my son's 26th birthday. And I want to do something special. So before the end of that conversation, we had a prayer vigil planned. And we would gather to, to pray, to, to bring something good out of something bad. To focus our gaze on prayer and nonviolence and the hope of bringing communities together. Our focus could be on many other things. We could focus on violence or yet another murder here in the city. We could think that there's nothing we can do. Yet God calls us to act. God calls us to, to reflect our gaze upon only Christ and the coming of the kingdom of God, just like Stephen did. So where is our gaze this morning? In the midst of the greatest of suffering, Stephen's gaze was upon his helpmate, his advocate, the standing Jesus. And he wouldn't have been able to 
stand in such face of, of opposition and persecution, especially not offering forgiveness at the end of his life without the power of the Holy Spirit. He kept his eyes on Jesus and so should we. Professor of early church history and spirituality, Amy Oden, called Stephen's gaze in this chapter in Acts the prophetic gaze. The prophetic gaze does not shy away from that which is wrong, she wrote. It does not shy away from injustice or gloss over transgression. The prophetic gaze does not avoid the painful truth. However, its eye is not focused on the transgressors. When much of our prophetic speech today is focused on them, and we can fill in the blank, Stephen's prophetic gaze is not on the transgressors. Rather, Stephen's prophetic eye is on the heavens, or we might say the kingdom, or the reign of God, or God's life here and now. And so Stephen refuses to give the angry mob the power of the center stage and reframes his own experience with the redemptive work of God. And the transforming work here is in verse 55 when Stephen raises his eyes toward heaven, which changes everything. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, when our gaze is upon the heavenly kingdom realm, we are able to reimagine how we might cultivate this reality, not only in our lives, but in our church and even in our community. And it might be in sacrificing in a way that, that I'm able to offer forgiveness and, and grace and mercy and love in a place that I didn't expect I could do it. Because really, it's not about me. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit at work in my life and yours, just as the Spirit was at work in Stephen's life, following his Savior. Following Jesus leads us to a prophetic gaze, to see things not as they are, but as they could be when God's kingdom comes to earth as it is in heaven. As I close in prayer this morning, I'd like to offer what's called a collect for St. Stephen's Day, which is celebrated on December 26th. A collect is a prayer that's meant to, to simply gather or collect the intentions of the people and focus us in our worship. So this is the collect for St. Stephen's Day. Let us pray. Grant, O oh Lord, that in all our sufferings up here upon earth, for the testimony of your truth, we may persistently look up to heaven and by faith behold the glory that shall be revealed and being filled with the Holy Spirit may learn to love and bless even our persecutors by the example of your first martyr, St. Stephen, who prayed for his murderers to you. O oh, blessed Jesus, who stands at the right hand of God to help all those that suffer for you, our only mediator and advocate, Jesus our Lord. Amen.